Hi guys and welcome to our Los Angeles English School YouTube channel. My name is Helen. If you don't know me, I'm head teacher here at Los Angeles English School and today I offer you a very nice test. This is the full listening TOEFL test. Uh, in order to do it, you need to get a copy book and a pen or a pencil because you will see all listening questions, but you need to take very good notes on a sheet of paper. Then you will see questions on the screen and you need to choose the correct option. So first you will be given a few moments to think about the answer then you need to choose the answer and then I will give you the answer to the question straight away so that you can check yourself so try to give your answer as quickly as possible because then I will give you the answer so and right away I want you to take notes on if your answer was wrong or if your answer was correct so that then you can evaluate it yourself and you can see your score. For TOEFL listening section, first you listen to the audio. You don't see the questions and that is why it's absolutely crucial to be able to take very good notes on everything that you can hear. Then you can use your notes while you will be answering the questions. Also guys, I will guide you how to calculate the score. So it is impossible to say how many questions you will see exactly. So, but I will give you some guidelines how you can evaluate yourself. So guys, usually um, all questions are worth one point. So one question is one point. But there are two types of questions which are chart questions and summary questions that can be worth more than one point. And you can use now these two tables to be able to calculate your score. So um, you can come back after you have done everything, you can go back here and you can check how many answers you got correctly for chart questions and summary questions and you can evaluate yourself. And here you also can see how you can calculate the overall score for your listening section. Because we don't know uh, the exact number of questions, um, sometimes it may vary. Uh, so you need to calculate it in the following way. So for example, if you had, let's say, 24 points out of a possible 25, in your listening section, you would divide 24 by 25 and you will get 96%. So, and you can see what 96% is, so it means you would get 29. Um, so, this is how you can calculate your score. So, I hope that it is clear. Listen to part of a lecture in an American government class. So today I want to go over the main points about what's called the Electoral College, that is the way that presidents are chosen in the United States. Also vice presidents too, of course. Now, um, some of you may think that the president is the candidate who gets the most votes from the voting public. Often that's true. But the way it works, it's not necessarily the one who gets the most votes from the public. In practice, it's the candidate who wins the most votes from the Electoral College. Okay, so let me try to make this clear. First of all, what is an elector? Well, an elector is a person, a member of a political party, who has been chosen by that party in a given state. Okay, so this person, this elector, is pledged to his or her party's candidate for president. So in any state, there are several electors. The number of electors in a state is equal to the number of U.S. senators plus the number of U.S. representatives in that state. <laughs> Don't get confused here. The senators and representatives are not the same people as the electors. It's just that the numbers are the same. So, 
There are always two senators in each state, as you know, but the number of representatives depends on the population of the state. So a populous state has several representatives, and a state without a lot of people will have only a few representatives. Some states, such as Alaska, which has a small population, for example, have only one representative at the current time. That means that Alaska will have three electors chosen by each political party. In total, there are currently 538 electoral votes in the whole country. Okay, so what happens when you vote in the presidential election? Well, what you have when you vote is a ballot, which normally says electors for and then the names of each of the presidential candidates running. So you choose electors for the candidate of your choice. Here's the interesting part, in a way. Whichever candidate wins the most popular votes in a state also wins all the electors of that state. So back to the case of Alaska. The candidate who wins the greatest share of the vote from the general public wins three electoral votes. Those three electors become the electors of that state. Now, okay, there are a couple of exceptions to that, but we'll have a look at those next week. Now, the election for president, where all the voting public cast their votes, is, as you know, in early November. Mm, okay, so the electors of the state, remember, these are the people who were in effect chosen through popular vote and who will vote for the candidate of their party, meet in December, and they cast their votes, one for the president and one for the vice president. Okay, so the candidate with the most electoral college votes, provided it's an absolute majority, that is, over half the total of electoral college votes, is declared president. The same goes for the vice president. If no one gets an absolute majority, then the U.S. House of Representatives chooses the president from among the top candidates. Well, there are also some problems associated with this system that you will hear raised from time to time. One problem, for example, that I can mention right off the bat is that it's possible that the person who is declared president through having won the most electoral college votes may not have won the majority of the general public's votes. This has to do with the fact that the distribution of electoral votes tends to overrepresent people in less populous states. Now, those who favor this system point out, however, that it more accurately represents all parts of the country, not just the metropolitan populous regions. So, in effect, it balances out rural and urban regions and contributes to national cohesion. There are several other things that opponents of this system have put forward, but I'd like you to read up on those before we meet next week. What is the lecture mainly about? According to the professor, who becomes an elector? Why does the professor say this? <laughs> Don't get confused here. The senators and representatives are not the same people as the electors.
Why does the professor use the example of Alaska in the lecture? Which candidate wins the presidential election? What does the professor mean when she says this? There are also some problems associated with this system that you will hear raised from time to time. Listen to a conversation between a student and a professor. Good morning, Dr. Blake. Sorry I'm running late. Oh, it's no problem, Angie. It, uh, it gave me a bit of time to review your research proposal. Oh, good. Uh, so you had a chance to look at my proposal. And what'd you think? Well, it's reasonably well presented. But if you really want to get that grant, I think you should explain how you're going to set up uh, get a more focused statistical analysis. Oh, I hadn't really given that point much thought. Because, frankly, uh, I'm not so sure what is the... Well, what the best way to go about it is. Well, you really need to clear that up. Why don't you go to the computer center? You can tell the woman at the information desk, um, Miriam, I think her name is. Tell Miriam what you need, and she'll direct you to one of the statisticians there. You know, someone who can tell you the best way to set up your experiment in order to get your statistics in a meaningful form. Then that procedure needs to be explained in your proposal. Okay. Oh, I'd better do that right away. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Proposals have to be in before the office closes on Friday, and you're going to want to have a clear idea of how you're going to deal with your data. Thanks. Bye. Uh, just a minute, Angie. Yes? Before you go, there are a couple more points. Let's see. I wrote a couple of comments on this draft you gave me. Oh, here you are. My concern is how you've defined, or I should say haven't defined, your subjects. You mentioned that you'll be testing non-native speakers' linguistic recognition of certain English stress patterns, but you haven't clearly defined the group of subjects. Well, I've made contact with a group of international students who are willing to work on the project. Yeah, I know, but there are some issues that the committee will question. The proposal as you have it seems, well, somewhat like comparing apples and oranges. We've talked about your subjects being given an oral fluency test so that you can choose subjects with about the same linguistic level. But you haven't made that clear in your proposal. The committee will say that the data from, oh, let's say, a tonal language speaker at a high level can't be compared to a romance language speaker at a beginning level. The data would be ambiguous. You see, you need to explain how you're going to select your subjects. You mean I should write more about the oral test we talked about? That's right. Oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Blake. I have a class in 20 minutes, and I want to get to the computer center. It's uh, on my way to the classroom building to set up an appointment. So could I come back around 3.30? Mm, no, that's not a good time for me. Why don't you read through my comments and work through the explanation about subject selection? And would you have time to bring your next draft in first thing tomorrow morning? We could go over the final details quickly, and that would give you time to make any other necessary changes before turning it in. Oh, I would really appreciate that, Dr. Blake. 
Thank you so much for your help. Bye. Why does the student go to see the professor? Why does the professor suggest that the student go to the computer center? According to the professor, what information should the student add in her proposal? Why does the professor say this? The proposal as you have it seems, well, somewhat like comparing apples and oranges. What does the professor imply about the people who will decide on the grant money? Listen to part of a discussion in a business correspondence class. We've been concentrating on formal letters in business communications. But today I'd like to talk about some issues in using email. Actually, we'll be looking at this topic for the next couple of class sessions, as it's likely much of your written communication in business will be done with email. And the etiquette of using email is extremely important in the business world. So, okay, there are two types of emails that you'll be using in business. Internal, those sent within the office, and the external, customers, suppliers, agencies. Now, we discussed the paper letter and how it could get separated from its envelope. So, it's essential for a paper letter to have all the receiver sender information in the letter itself. Now, most email programs include the receiver sender information. So the message can't get separated from this information. But there are a few options that some people are not aware of. And unfortunately, not all programs have all these options. Okay, let's say there are 30 people in the office where you work and you want to tell them about a change in policy. How do you set up your email? I mean, who do you send this message to? What do you put into the box? Well, I put the names into the two box, you know, the box where I put the names of the people who will get the message. Okay, so you would type all 30 names into the receiver box? Well, probably not type. I might make a mistake. I'd copy them in, or use the reply to all icon from another email. And of course, I'd change the message and the subject. Okay, that is one way. Yes? Um. Yeah, I have to do a lot of, like, um, official emails, and I get really annoyed when people send me a message with lots of names in it. Sometimes I print out the message, and I get, like, three pages of people's addresses for half a page of message. So what do you suggest? 
Well, I usually set up my address book so that I can put all the names of people into one group. And then when I want to send them all a message, I just put the name of the group into the receiver box. And then everyone gets the message. That way, if they print it out, then only the name of the group is on the page. Yeah, I don't like that because, well, what annoys me is I need someone's address, right? So I go to a message to get it and it isn't there because just the group name is there. Or I want to see if everyone is on the list and, and that no one has been left out. Okay. So we have two differing opinions on what to put into the receiver box for mail within a company. We'll come back to this point in a moment. Now, let's change the audience. Suppose the message is that you'll be moving to a new office and you want to tell all your customers the new location. Well, that's different then. Because you can't put all the customers' names and addresses into the receiver box. I mean, that's private information, isn't it? So you got to use a group name. No, 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 I don't agree. I mean, I do agree that it's important to have customer anonymity, but if you put a group name, then it isn't personalized. I really think the customer wants to be addressed by their name, not something like customer group. Using a name is saying you are an important individual instead of you're just a name on this list. So what would you do? You don't want to put their names in a list for all to see, and you don't want to address them impersonally. Well, I guess I would write to them individually so that I could keep, well, maintain privacy and still be sort of personal. That sounds like a lengthy process, especially if your customers are in the thousands. A lot of work. Any other suggestions? No one? Okay. Remember when we were discussing the formal business letter? We talked about a blind copy. Remember how you use a blind copy when you don't want the receiver to know who else is receiving copies? Most email systems have a blind copy function, but it doesn't usually appear automatically. You have to change your settings for it to show up on your screen. I send myself the message and put everyone's address, including my own, as a check into the blind copy box. Every individual receives the message addressed as if he or she was the only recipient of the message. What is the discussion mainly about? Listen again to part of the discussion. Then answer the question. Okay. So we have two differing opinions on what to put into the receiver box for mail within a company. We'll come back to this point in a moment. Now, let's change the audience. Why does the professor say this? We'll come back to this point in a moment. Now, let's change the audience. What can be inferred about the students? Listen again to part of the discussion. Then answer the question. That sounds like a lengthy process, especially if your customers are in the thousands. A lot of work. Any other suggestions? No one? Okay. Remember when we were discussing the formal business letter? We talked about a blind copy. Why does the professor ask this? Remember when we were discussing the formal business letter? We talked about a blind copy.
According to the discussion, which way both protects customer identity and promotes customer personalization? Which of the following are valid points about messages sent to a group address instead of individual addresses? Listen to part of a lecture in a literature class. Before I continue, I want to sketch in some of the significant events of the life of the writer Jack London. This biographical outline is really just to give you a general picture, so that you can perhaps appreciate how his life and work were related. It's quite clear, I think you'll agree, that the kind of life London led really did show up in the kinds of stories he wrote. But before I go on, I want to remind you all that on Tuesday, I'll be presenting an overview of London's major works. So in preparation for that, I'd like you to read his small masterpiece, To Build a Fire. Okay, now where was I? London was born in San Francisco in 1876. In fact, he never knew his real father, who had left his mother before Jack was born. Biographers have suggested that the anxiety London felt at not knowing the identity of his real father is clearly shown in the themes of many of his books, which often deal with the struggle for survival and the harshness of the natural and human world. So, I think it's true that we get a feel in his stories that London is often trying to make sense of the difficult events of his childhood. As a young man, Jack worked at various jobs some menial and dangerous, and often adventurous. For example, he sailed the Pacific, worked on a fish patrol to catch poachers, raided oyster farms, prospected for gold, joined an army of unemployed workers, and even spent time in jail. Now, why is all this so significant? Well, it really comes back to the way London used his life experiences in the characters and themes of his stories. In light of the often harsh experiences he dealt with in these kinds of jobs, I think we can also understand what attracted him to socialism and the struggle for improved social and working conditions. London's learning was gained largely outside of institutions. In other words, he learned mainly from experience, but was determined to improve himself and enrolled as a student at the University of California. However, he dropped out after one semester due to a lack of money and perhaps disillusionment with university life. Any of you feel that way? <laughs> <laughs> of course, it's true that he was always a keen reader and studied the works of other writers in order to learn to become a writer himself. I think we can say that he consciously chose the life of a writer in order to escape the unpleasant prospect of manual work. The adventurous life he led provided him with a great deal of material from which to create imaginative literature. Most writers and intellectuals, of course, know about the struggle for survival only from their readings and observations. London, by contrast, experienced poverty, struggle, and danger firsthand. Take, for example, one of his first published stories, Story of a Typhoon off the Coast of Japan which was taken directly from his experience as a sailor in the Pacific when he was just 17. It is clear in this story, as in so many others of London's, that we, the readers, feel the directness of his writing. And this, I think we can say, is because he wrote about what he knew and experienced so deeply. Now, at first, his submissions to publishers met with very little success. However, he was very determined and he forced himself to write 1,000 words per day. This disciplined approach to writing eventually paid off, and he gained international fame with a large output of writing. In total, he published over 150 stories, 18 novels, and seven books of non-fiction, and many of them were translated into different languages. 
His novel, The Call of the Wild, was the one that brought him lasting fame, and many of his short stories are considered classics. It's true to say, though, I think we can admit, that not all his works are especially good literature. He often wrote carelessly, and there's a considerable part of his output which I think it is fair to say is uninspired and uninteresting to the modern reader. In the last period of his life, London tried his hand at agriculture. Much of his later writing, in fact, is concerned with the pleasures of country life and the satisfaction to be gained from earning a living from the land. He pursued this interest with characteristic energy at his ranch in California, and he continued a tight work schedule right up to his premature death at the age of 40 in November 1916. What is the lecture mainly about? According to the professor, what effect did the absence of a father have on London? What does the professor mean when he says this? However, he dropped out after one semester due to a lack of money and perhaps disillusionment with university life. Any of you feel that way? Why does the professor think that London read so many books? What does the professor imply about London's success? What does the professor think of London's work? Listen to a discussion in an anthropology class. So, I'd like to move on to a discussion of a group of people who vanished from the Earth around 30,000 years ago after having existed successfully for approximately a quarter of a million years. They're known as the Neanderthal people, named, by the way, after a place in Germany where their bones, their, their remains, were first found in 1856. Now, let's first look at how these people compared with the other main group of humans existing at that time, known as the Cro-Magnon. Now, the remains of Cro-Magnon people show that they were anatomically similar. In other words, their body structure was physically more or less identical to modern humans. Okay, does anyone know how our Cro-Magnon ancestors look different from these Neanderthals? Didn't they have a different skull shape? Yes, yes. Uh, but can you be more precise? Um, well, okay. The Neanderthals had a sloping forehead and no real chin. Okay. Certainly, their chins were not prominent and their forehead sloped backwards. So, they looked rather different from the Cro-Magnon. Okay. Now, 
What about their cultural and technological lives? Were they so much different from their Cro-Magnon cousins? Yes? Uh, they had the ability to make stone tools, so that was a similarity. Yes, although their tool-making ability appears to have been less developed than that of the Cro-Magnon. They did know how to make stone into useful tools, but they don't appear to have developed fine points or, or blades. And their wooden spears seem to have been adapted for stabbing, but not for throwing. The Cro-Magnon, on the other hand, developed spears with tips carved from, from bone and stone and other materials. They also used bows and arrows and invented handles for their tools and weapons. Now, those are things the Neanderthals didn't develop. Yes? Well, um, didn't the Neanderthals know how to make fire? Yes. Now, that's a very good point. They could make fire and transport it when necessary. And that is an important skill that they shared with the Cro-Magnon. Also, they may have had some simple art forms, but again, fairly undeveloped in comparison with the Cro-Magnon, whose artistic sophistication is well documented. But, you know, there's a recent find, a polished baby mammoth tooth, which suggests that the Neanderthals may have produced items for personal adornment, now, both these points show that the Neanderthals may not have been as backward as was once claimed. Do you think the Neanderthals had the ability to produce language? Oh, now that's an interesting question. Studies of skull capacity and shape indicate that they probably had similar neurological capacities to modern humans. So, in other words, they certainly had the mental apparatus to produce language. Now, by examining the bone remains of the vocal tract area, we can say that they could produce sounds, too. But they would not have been able to produce a large number of sounds, and their speech articulation may have been slow. By contrast, the Cro-Magnon would have had the ability to produce language and speech sounds just as modern humans. Okay. So what happened to the Neanderthals? Well, this question has produced a lot of controversy, even division within the scientific community. So, broadly speaking, we can say that there are two main lines of thought here. First, it's possible that the Neanderthals may have died out due to a relative lack of sophistication in comparison to the Cro-Magnon. The Cro-Magnon people arrived in regions inhabited by Neanderthals about 40,000 years ago. And then around 30,000 years ago, the climate became more severe, and the Cro-Magnons would have been better adapted to survival under these conditions, since they had, as we noted earlier, better weapons and tools and more developed speech. So, in competition for territory, or in hunting, they would have been more successful. Some people have gone so far as to suggest that the Neanderthals were deliberately destroyed by the newcomers, or perhaps killed off by diseases brought in with them. So that's one general line of thought. Now, a second approach is to hypothesize that the Neanderthals and the Cro-Magnon interbred, and that over time, the Cro-Magnon genes became more dominant so that eventually the Neanderthal characteristics disappeared. During the same period, the Neanderthal culture would also have been absorbed into the more dominant Cro-Magnon culture. If they did manage to interbreed, this would mean, of course, that the two types of people were not separate species. And if this scenario is right, it would have appeared as though the Neanderthals had become extinct whereas in reality, they would have merged with the more dominant Cro-Magnon people. Now, I want to emphasize that this issue is still very much debated by anthropologists. A lot of the focus of current research is on trying to determine whether either Cro-Magnon remains or modern humans have any traces of Neanderthal DNA. If they do, then a better case for claiming that the two peoples interbred could be made, and hence, the second of these two hypotheses would be strengthened.
What is the main purpose of the lecture? Why does the professor say this? They were anatomically similar. In other words, their body structure was physically more or less identical to modern humans. Why does the professor refer to the Neanderthal's ability to make and transport fire? What does the professor not mention about the Neanderthal's use of language? Indicate whether each sentence below describes Neanderthal or Cro-Magnon characteristics. According to the professor, why is a comparison of Neanderthal and modern human DNA useful? Listen to part of a conversation at a campus police station. Yes, how can I help you? Yeah, uh, I think my car has been stolen. Okay, can you give me the details? Yeah, uh, it's a 1999 four-wheel drive blue Subaru. Okay, and when and where did you last see it? Well, this morning I parked it in front of Lacey Hall. Let me check our records. Ah, it appears your car was in a faculty-only zone. Yeah, I know. But the handicapped parking spaces were all taken, and I had to find a place so I could get easy access to my classes. Uh-huh. But since you don't have a faculty parking sticker, your car was towed. I was hoping that because I had a handicap sticker, it would be okay. There may have been a complaint from a faculty member. Well, sometimes that happens when a professor can't get to work on time because someone who isn't faculty is parked in faculty parking. So the tow truck was called. Okay. Um, how do I get my car back? Well, when a vehicle has to be towed, the owner must pay for the towing and storage fees before the car can be taken. And I'm sorry to say, there's also a parking fine. And how much will all that be? Um... The towing fee is 
$90, and there's a storage fee of $10 per day. So it'd be a good idea to pick up your car today, if possible. The parking fine is $50, but if you pay within seven days, the fine is reduced to $20. I think, well, all this is very unfair. If the university is going to charge so much, they should have more spaces. My car gets towed because the handicapped parking spaces are full. One of the cars didn't even have a handicapped sticker. Uh, well, you know, don't you, that you do have the right to appeal. Since you believe that circumstances exist that may excuse you from certain university regulations. Oh, so how do I go about doing that? Well, first, you write a letter of appeal. Well, that can be done online. You can go to the University Traffic Regulations page. You know the university homepage? Uh-huh. Okay. Um, in your letter, explain the situation and why you believe the ticket was unfair. You'll get a letter immediately saying that your case is being reviewed. Later, you'll get a reply stating whether or not your appeal is accepted. The fine is put on hold as soon as the letter of appeal has been received. If the charge isn't dropped, then you have seven days to pay up or to make a further appeal. Okay. Thank you for your help. Okay. Good luck. Why did the student go to the campus police? What can be inferred about the student? Listen again to part of the conversation, then answer the question. Well, when a vehicle has to be towed, the owner must pay for the towing and storage fees before the car can be taken. And I'm sorry to say, there's also a parking fine. What does the officer mean when she says this? And I'm sorry to say... Listen again to part of the conversation, then answer the question. Uh, well, you know, don't you, that you do have the right to appeal. Since you believe that circumstances exist that may excuse you from certain university regulations. Why does the officer say this? Uh, well, you know, don't you, that you do have the right to appeal. What will the student probably do? All right, guys, so my congratulations to you if you came to the end of the listening section. I hope that you did well and now you can calculate your score. If you haven't subscribed to this YouTube channel yet, make sure to hit the subscribe button and also the bell icon, of course, if you'd like to get notified of all our upcoming lessons. Uh, if you're preparing for IELTS or TOEFL, make sure to visit our website losangelesinenglishschool.com and we have IELTS and TOEFL preparation lessons as well as evaluation of your TOEFL speaking and writing and IELTS writing so you can just record your speaking responses and we will evaluate them or you can write an essay and send it to us and you can get the professional evaluation with a score so I wish you have a great day and I hope to see you 
in my next lesson. Bye guys.